there. I got a request to do a whispered video. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. And I'm reading from a game of thrones. And this is chapter 31. I stood last vigil for him myself, Sir Barristan Selmy said, as they looked down at the body in the back of the cart. He had no one else, a mother in the veil, I am told. In the pale dawn light, the young knight looked as though he were sleeping. He had not been handsome, but death had smoothed his rough-hewn features, and the silent sisters had dressed him in the best velvet tunic with a high collar to cover the ruin the lance had made of his throat. Eddard Stark looked at his face and wondered if he had been, for his sake, that the boy had died. Slain by a Lannister bannerman before Ned could speak to him, could that be more happenstance? He supposed he would never know. He was John Aaron's squire for four years, so we went on. The king knighted him before he rode north, in John's memory. The lad wanted it desperately, yet I fear he was not ready. Ned had slept badly last night, and he felt tired beyond his ears. None of us is ever ready, he said. For knighthood? For death. Gently, Ned covered the boy with his cloak blood-stained bit of blue-bordered and crescent moons. When his mother asked why her son was dead, he reflected bitterly. They would tell her he had fought to honor the king's hand, Eddard Stark. This was needless. War should not be a game. Ned turned to the woman beside the cart, shrouded in gray, face hidden but for her eyes. The silent sisters prepared men for the grave and it was ill fortune to look on the face of death. Send his armor home to the Vale. The mother will want to have it. It is worth a fair price of silver, Sir Barristan said. The boy had it forged special for the tourney. Plain work, but good. I do not know if he had finished paying the smith. He paid yesterday, my lord. And he paid dearly, Ned replied. And to the silent sister he said, Send the mother the armor. I will deal with this smith. She bowed her head. Afterward, Sir Barristan walked with Ned to the king's pavilion. The camp was beginning to stir. Fat sausages sizzled and spit over fire pits, spicing the air with the scents of garlic and pepper. Young squires hurried on errands as their masters woke, yawning and stretching to meet the day. A serving man with a goose under his arm bent his knee when he caught the sight of them. My lords, he muttered as the goose honked and pecked at his fingers. The shields displayed outside each tent heralded its occupant. The silver eagle of Seaguard, Bryce Cairns' field of nightingales, a cluster of grapes for the red wines, brindled boar, red ox, running tree, white ram, triple spiral, purple unicorn, dancing maiden, black ladder, twin towers, horned owl, and the last the pure white blazons of the king's guard, shining like the dawn. The king means to fight in the melee today, Sir Barristan said, as they were passing Sir Mirren's shield, its paint sullied by a deep gash where Loris Tyrell's lance had scarred the wood as he drove him from his saddle. Yes, Ned said grimly. Jory had woken him last night to bring him that news. Small wonder he had slept so badly. Sir Barristan's look was troubled. They say night's beauties fade at dawn, and the children of wine are oft disowned in the morning light. They say so. Ned agreed, but not of Robert. Other men might reconsider the words spoken in drunken bravado, but Robert Baratheon would remember, and remembering would never back down. 
The king's pavilion was close by the water, and the morning mists of the river had wreathed it in wisps of grey. It was all of golden silk, the largest and grandest structure in the camp. Outside the entrance, Robert's warhammer was displayed beside an immense iron shield blazoned with the crowned stag of House Baratheon. Ned had hoped to discover the king still abed in wine-soaked sleep, but luck was not with him. They found Robert drinking beer from a polished horn and roaring his displeasure at two young squires who were trying to buckle him into his armor. "'Your grace,' one was saying, almost in tears, "'it's made too small. It won't go.' He fumbled, and the gorget he was trying to fit around Robert's thick neck tumbled to the ground. Seven hells, Robert swore. Do I have to do it myself? Piss on both of you. Pick it up. Don't just stand there gaping. Lancel, pick it up. The lad jumped, and the king noticed his company. Look at these hoves, Ned. My wife insisted I take these two to squire for me, and they're worse. They're useless. Can't even put a man's armor on him properly. Squires, they say. I say they're swineherds dressed up in silk. Ned only needed to glance to understand the difficulty. The boys are not at fault, he told the king. You're too fat for your armor, Robert. Robert Baratheon took a long swallow of beer, tossed the empty horn into the sleeping furs, wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, and said darkly, Fat? Fat, is it? Is that how you speak to your king? He let go his laughter, sudden as a storm. Ah, damn you, Ned, why are you always right? The squire smiled nervously until the king turned on them. You, yes, both of you, you heard the hand. The king is too fat for his armor. Go find Aaron Stantigar. Tell him I need the breastplate stretcher. Now, what are you waiting for? The boys tripped over each other in their haste to be quit of the tent. Robert managed to keep a stern face until they were gone. Then he dropped back into a chair, shaking with laughter. Sir Barristan Selmy chuckled with him. Even Eddard Stark managed to smile. Always, though, the graver thoughts crept in. He could not help taking note of the two squires. Handsome boys, fair and well-made. One was Sansa's age, with long golden curls. The other perhaps fifteen sandy-haired with the wisp of a mustache and the emerald green eyes of the queen. Ah, I wish I could be there to see Santagar's face, Robert said. I hope he'll have the wit to send them to someone else. We ought to keep them running all day. Those boys, Ned asked him. Lannisters? Robert nodded, wiping tears from his eyes. Cousins, sons of Lord Tywin's brother, one of the dead ones. Or perhaps a live one, now that I come to think of it. I don't recall. My wife comes from a very large family, Ned. A very ambitious family, Ned thought. He had nothing against the squires, but it troubled him to see Robert surrounded by the queen's kin, waking and sleeping. The Lannister's appetite for offices and honors seemed to know no bounds. The talk is you and the queen had angry words last night. The mirth curdled on Robert's face. The woman tried to forbid me to fight in the melee. She's sulking in the castle now, damn her. Your sister would never have shamed me like that. You never knew Lyanna as I did, Robert, Ned told him. You saw her beauty, but not the iron underneath. She would have told you that you have no business in the melee. You too, the king frowned. You are a sour man, Stark. Too long in the north, all the juices have frozen inside you. Well, mine are still running. He slapped his chest to prove it. You are the king, Ned reminded him. I sit on the damn iron seat when I must. Does that mean I don't have the same hungers as other men? A bit of wine now and again, a girl squealing in bed, a feel of a horse between my legs. Seven hells, Ned, I want to hit someone. Sir Barrist and Selmy woke up, spoke up. Your grace, he said, it is not seemly that the king should ride into the melee. It would not be a fair contest. Who would dare strike you? Robert seemed honestly taken aback. Why, all of them, damn it, if they can. 
and the last man left standing will be you, Ned finished. He saw at once that Selmy had hit the mark. The dangers of the melee were only a savour to Robert, but this touched on his pride. The Bar Sir Barristan is right. There is not a man in the Seven Kingdoms who would dare risk your displeasure by hurting you. The king rose to his feet, his face flushed. Are you telling me those prancing cravens will let me win? For a certainty, Ned said, and Sir Barristan Selmy bowed his head in silent accord. For a moment, Robert was so angry he could not speak. He strode across the tent, whirled, strode back, his face dark and angry. He snatched up his breastplate from the ground and threw it at Barristan Selmy in a wordless fury. Selmy dodged. Get out, the king said then, coldly. Get out before I kill you. Sir Barristan left quickly. Ned was about to follow when the king called out again. Not you, Ned. Ned turned back. Robert took up his horn again, filled it with beer from a barrel in the corner and thrust it at Ned. Drink, he said brusquely. I have no thirst. Drink. Your king commands it. Ned took the horn and drank. The beer was black and thick, so strong it stung his eyes. Robert sat down again. Damn you, Ned Stark. You and John Aaron, I loved you both. What have you done to me? You were the one should have been king. You were John. You had the better claim, your grace. I told you to drink, not to argue. You made me king. You could at least have the courtesy to listen when I talked, damn you. Look at me, Ned. Look at what King has done to me. God's too fat for my armor. How did it ever come to this? Robert, drink and stay quiet. The King is talking. I swear to you I was never so alive as when I was winning this throne, or so dead now that I've won it. And Cersei, I have John Aaron to think for her. I had no wish to marry after Lyanna was taken from me. But John said the realm needed an heir. Cersei Lannister would be a good match, he told me. She would bind Lord Tywin and me, and should Viserys Targaryen ever try to win back his father's throne. The king shook his head. I loved that old man, I swear it. But now I think he was a bigger fool than Moon Boy. Oh, Cersei is lovely to look at, truly, but cold. The way she guards her cunt, you think she had all the gold of Casterly Rock between her legs. Here, give me that beer if you won't drink it. He took the horn, upended it, belched, wiped his mouth. I'm sorry for your girl, Ned. Truly. About the wolf, I mean. My son was lying. I'd stake my soul on it. My son. You love your children, don't you? With all my heart. Ned said. Let me tell you a secret, Ned. More than once I have dreamed of giving up the crown. Take ship for the free cities with my horse and my hammer. Spend my time warring and whoring. That's what I was meant for. The sellsword king, how singers would love me. You know what stops me? The thought of Joffrey on the throne, with Cersei standing behind him, whispering in his ear. My son, how could I have made a son like that, Ned? He's only a boy, Ned said awkwardly. He had small liking for Prince Joffrey, but he could hear the pain in Robert's voice. Have you forgotten how wild you were at his age? It would not trouble me if the boy was wild, Ned. You don't know him as I do. He sighed and shook his head. Ah, perhaps you are right. John despaired of me often enough, yet I grew into a good king. Robert looked at Ned, and scowled at his silence. You might speak up and agree now, you, you know. Your grace, Ned began carefully. Robert slapped Ned on the back. Ah, say that I'm a better king than Eris, and I'll be done with it. You never could lie for love or honor, Ned Stark. I'm still young, and now that you're here with me, things will be different. We'll make this rain to sing of, and damn the Lannisters to seven hells. I smell bacon. Who do you think our champion will be today? 
Have you seen Mace Tyrell's boy, the Knight of the Flowers? They call him. Now there's a son any man would be proud to own. Last tourney he dumped the King's Slayer on his golden rump. You ought to have seen the look on Cersei's face. I laughed till my sides hurt. Renly says he has this sister who made of fourteen lovely as dawn. They broke their fast on black bread and boiled goose eggs, and fish fried up with onions and bacon at a trestle table by the river's edge. The king's melancholy melted away with the morning mist, and before long Robert was eating an orange and waxing, waxing fond about a morning at the Erie when they were when they had been boys. Had given John a barrel of oranges, remember? Only the things had gone rotten, so I flung mine across the table and hit Dax right on the nose. You remember, Red Fort's pock-faced squire? He tossed one back at me, and before John could so much as fart, there were oranges flying across the high hall in every direction. He laughed uproariously, and even Ned smiles, remembering. This was the boy he had grown up with, he thought. This was the Robert Baratheon he'd known and loved. If he could prove that the Lannisters were behind the attack on Bran, prove that they had murdered John Arryn, this man would listen. Then, Cersei would fall, and the Kingslayer with her, and if Lord Tywin dared to rouse the West, Robert would smash him as he had smashed Rhaegar Targaryen on the Trident. He could see it all so clearly. That breakfast tasted better than anything Eddard Stark had eaten in a long time, and afterwards his smiles came easier and more often, until it was time for the tournament to resume. Ned walked with the king to the jousting field. He had promised to watch the final tilt with Sansa. Septimor Dan was ill today, and the daughter was determined not to miss the end of the jousting. As he saw Robert to his place, he noted that Cersei Lannister had chosen not to appear. The place beside the king was empty. That, too, gave Ned cause to hope. He shouldered his way to where his daughter was seated, and found her as the horns blew for the first day's joust. Sansa was so engrossed, she scarcely seemed to notice his arrival. Sandra Clegan was the first rider to appear. He wore an olive green cloak over his soot gray armor. That, and his hound's head helm, were on his only concession to ornament. A hundred golden dragons on the King's Slayer, Littlefinger announced loudly, as Jamie Lannister entered the lists, riding an elegant blood bay destrier. The horse wore a blanket of gilded rin mail, and Jamie glittered from head to heel. Even his lance was fashioned from the golden wood of the Summer Isles. Done, Lord Renly shouted back. The hound has a hungry look about him this morning. Even hungry dogs know better than to bite the hand that feeds them, Littlefinger called dryly. Sander Clegane dropped his visor with an audible clang and took up his position. Sir Jamie tossed a kiss to some woman in the commons gently lowered his visor, and rode to the end of the lists. Both men crouched their lances. Ned Stark would have loved nothing so well as to see them both lose, but Sansa was watching, all moist-eyed and eager. The hastily erected gallery trembled as the horses broke into a gallop. The hound leaned forward as he rode, his lance rock steady, but Jamie shifted his seat deftly, in the instant before impact. Clegane's point was turned harmlessly against the golden shield of the lion blazon, while his own hit square. Wood shattered, and the hound reeled, fighting to keep his seat. Sansa gasped. A ragged cheer went up from the commons. I wonder how I ought to spend your money, Littlefinger called down to Lord Renly. The hound just managed to stay in the saddle. He jerked his mount around hard and rode back to the lists for the second pass. Jamie Lannister tossed down his broken lance and snatched up a fresh one, jesting with his squire. The hound spurred forward at a hard gallop. Lannister rode to meet him. This time, when Jamie shifted his seat, 
Sandrock again shifted with him. Both lances exploded, and by the time the splinters had settled, the riderless blood bay was tridung off in search of grass, while Sir Jamie Lannister rolled in the dirt, golden and dented. Sansa said, I knew that hound would win. Littlefinger overheard. If you know who's going to win the second match, speak up now before Lenry pl Lord Renly plucks me clean, he called to her. Ned smiled. A pity the imp is not here with us, Lord Renly said. I should have won twice as much. Jamie Lannister was back on his feet, but his ornate lion helmet had been twisted around and dented in his fall, and now he could not get it off. The commons were hooting and pointing. The lords and ladies were trying to stifle their chuckles and failing, and over it all Ned could hear King Robert laughing louder than anyone. Finally, they had to lead the Lion of Lannister off to the blacksmith, blind and stumbling. By then, Sir Gregor Clegane was in position at the head of the lists. He was huge, the biggest man Eddard Stark had ever seen. Robert Baratheon and his brothers were all big men, as was the Hound, and back at Winterfell there was a simple-minded stable boy named Hodor, who dwarfed them all, but the knight they called the Mountain That Rides would have towered over Hodor. He was well over seven feet tall, closer to eight, with massive shoulders and th arms thick as the trunks of small trees. His destrier seemed a pony in between his armored legs, and the lance he carried looked as small as a broom handle. Unlike his brother, Sir Gregor did not live at court. He was a solitary man who seldom left his own lands, but for wars and tourneys. He had been with Lord Tywin when King's Landing fell, a new-made knight of seventeen years, even then distinguished by his size and implacable ferocity. Some said it had been Gregor who had dashed the skull of the infant Prince Aegon Targaryen against a wall, and whispered that afterward he had raped the mother, the Dornish Princess Elia, before putting her to the sword. Things, things were not said in Gregor's hearing. Ned Stark could not recall ever speaking to the man, though Gregor had ridden with them during Balon Greyjoy's rebellion, one night among thousands. He watched him with disquiet. Ned seldom put much stock in gossip, but the things said of Sir Gregor were more than ominous. He was soon to be married for the third time, and one heard dark whisperings about the deaths of his first two wives. It was said that his keep was a grim place, where servants disappeared unaccountably, and even the dogs were afraid to enter the hall. And there had been a sister who had died young under queer circumstances, and the fire that had disfigured his brother, and the hunting accident that had killed their father. Gregor had inherited the keep, the gold, and the family estates. His younger brother Sandor had left the same day to take service with the Lannisters as a sworn sword, and it was said that he had never returned, not even to visit. When the Knight of the Flowers made his entrance, a murmur ran through the crowd, and he heard Sansa's fervent whisper, Oh, he's so beautiful. Sir Loras Tyrell was slender as a reed, dressed in a suit of fabulous silver armor polished to a blinding sheen and filigreed with twinning black vines and tiny blue forget-me-nots. The commons realized in the same instant as Ned the blue flowers came from sapphires. A gasp went up from a thousand throats. Across the boy's shoulders, his cloak hung heavy. It was woven of forget-me-nots, real ones, hundreds of fresh blooms sewn into a heavy woolen cape. His courser was as slim as her rider, a beautiful gray mare built for speed. Sir Gregor's huge stallion trumpeted, as he caught her scent. The boy from Highgarden did something with his legs, and the horse pranced sideways, nimble as a dancer. Sansa clutched at his arm. Father, don't let Sir Gregor hurt him, she said, 
and then saw she was wearing the rose that Sir Loras had given her yesterday. Jory had told her about that as well. These are tourney lances, he told his daughter. They make them to splinter on impact so no one is hurt. Yet, he remembered the dead boy in the cart this, with this cloak of crescent moons, and the words were raw in his throat. Sir Gregor was having trouble controlling his horse. The stallion was screaming and pawing the ground, shaking his head. The mountain kicked at the animal savagely with an armored boot. The horse reared and almost threw him. The knight of flowers saluted the king, rose to the far end of the list, and couched his lance, ready. Sir Gregor brought his animal to the line, fighting with the reins. And suddenly it began. The mountain stallion broke into a hard gallop, plunging forward wildly, while the mare charged as smooth and as the flow of silk. Sir Gregor wrenched his shield in position, juggled with his lance, and all the while fought to hold his unruly mount in a straight line. And suddenly, Loris Tyrell was on him, placing the point of his lance just there, and in the blink of the eye, the mountain was falling. He was so huge that he took his horse down with him in a tangle of steel and flesh. Ned heard applause, cheers, whistles, shocked gasps, excited murderings, and over it all, the rasping, raucous laughter of the hound. The knight of the flowers reined up at the end of the lists. His lance was not even broken. His sapphires winked in the sun as he raised his visor, smiling. The commons went mad for him. In the middle of the field, Sir Gregor Clagan disentangled himself and came boiling to his feet. He wrenched off his helm and slammed it down into the ground. His face was dark with fury, and his hair fell down onto his eyes. My sword, he shouted to his squire, and the boy ran it out to him. By then, his stallion was back on his feet as well. Gregor Clagan killed the horse with a single blow of such ferocity that it half severed the animal's neck. Cheers turned to shrieks in a heartbeat. The stallion went to his knees, screaming as it died. By then, Gregor was striding down the lists towards Loris Tyrell, his bloody sword clutched in his fist. Stop him, Ned shouted, but his words were lost in the roar. Everyone else was yelling as well, and Sansa was crying. It all happened so fast. The Knight of the Flowers was shouting for his own sword, as Sir Gregor knocked his squire aside and made a grab for the reins of his horse. The mare scented blood and roared. Loris Tyrell kept his seat, but barely. Sir Gregor slung his, swung his sword, a savage two-handed blow that took the boy in the chest and knocked him from the saddle. The courser dashed away in the panic, as Sir Loris lay stunned in the dirt. But, as Gregor lifted his sword from the killing blow, a rasping voice warned, Leave him be, and a steel-clad hand wrenched him away from the boy. The mountain pivoted in wordless fury, swinging his longsword in a killing arc with all his massive strength behind it. But the hound caught the blow and turned it, and for what seemed like an eternity, the two brothers stood hammering at each other as a dazed Loris Tyrell was held to safety. Thrice, Ned saw Sir Gregor aim savage blows at the hound's head helmet, but not once did Sandor send a cut at his brother's unprotected face. It was the king's voice that put an end to it, the king's voice and twenty swords. John Aaron had told them that a commander needs a good battlefield voice and Robert had proved the truth of that on the trident. He used that voice now. Stop this madness, he boomed, in the name of your king. The hound went to one knee. Sir Gregor's blow cut air, and at last he came to his senses. He dropped his sword and glared at Robert, surrounded by his king's guard and a dozen other knights and guardsmen. Wordlessly, he turned, and strode off, 
shoving past Barris and Selmy. Let him go, Robert said, and as quickly as that, it was over. Is the hound the champion now? Sansa asked Ned. No, he told her. There will be one final joust between the hound and the knight of the flowers. But Sansa had the right of it after all. A few moments later, Sir Loras Tyrell walked back onto the field in a simple linen doublet and said to Sandor Clegan, I owe you my life. The day is yours, sir. I am no sir, the hound replied, but he took the victory and the champion's purse, and, for perhaps the first time in his life, the love of the commons. They cheered him as he left the lists to return to the pavilion. As Ned walked with Sansa to the archery field, Littlefinger and Lord Renly and some of the others fell in with them. Tyrell had to know the mare was in heat, Littlefinger was saying. I swear the boy planned this whole thing. Gregor has always favored huge, ill-tempered stallions with more spirit than sense. The notion seemed to amuse him. It did not amuse Sir Barristan Selmy. There is small honor in tricks, the old men said stiffly. Small honor and twenty thousand golds, Lord Renly smiled. That afternoon, a boy named Angui, an unheralded commoner from the Dornish marches, won the archery competition, outshirting Sir Berlon Swan and Jalabar Show, at a hundred paces after all the bowmen had been eliminated at shorter distances. Ned sent Sir Alan to seek him out and offer him position with the hand's guard, but the boy was flush with wine and victory and riches undreamed of, and he refused. The melee went on for three hours. Near forty men took part, free riders and hedge knights and new-made squires in search of reputation. They fought with blunted weapons in the chaos of mud and blood, small troops fighting together, and then turning on each other as alliances formed and fractured, till only one man was left standing. The victor was the red priest, Thoris of Mir, a madman who shaved his head and fought with a flaming sword. He had won melees before. The fire sword frightened the mounts of other riders, but nothing frightened Thoros. The final tally was three broken limbs, a shattered collarbone, a dozen smashed fingers, two horses that had to be put down, and more cuts, sprains, and bruises than anyone cared to count. Ned was desperately pleased that Robert had not taken part. That night at the feast, Eddard Stark was more hopeful than he had been in a great while. Robert was in good humor, the Lannisters were nowhere to be seen, and even his daughters were behaving. Jory brought Arya down to join them, and Sansa spoke to her sister pleasantly. The tournament was magnificent, she sighed. You should have come. How was your dancing? I'm sore all over, Arya reported happily proudly displaying a huge purple bruise on her leg. "'You must be a terrible dancer,' Sansa said doubtfully. Later, while Sansa was off listening to a troop of singers perform the complex rounds of interwoven ballads called The Dance of the Dragons, Ned inspected the bruise himself. "'I hope Pharrell is not being too hard on you,' he said. Sansa stood on one leg. She was getting much better at that of late. Sirio says every hurt is a lesson, and every lesson makes you better. Ned frowned. The man Sirio Farrell had come with an excellent reputation, and his flamboyant bravosi style was well suited to Arya's slender blade. Yet still, a few days ago she had been seen wandering around with the swatch of black silk tied over her eyes. Sirio was teaching her to see with her ears and her nose and her skin, she told him. Before that, he had her doing spins and backflips. Arya, are you certain you want to persist with this? She nodded. Tomorrow we're going to catch cats. Cats, Ned sighed. Perhaps it was a mistake to hire this bravosi. If you like, I will ask Jory to take over your lessons. 
or might have a quiet word with Sir Barristan. He was the finest sword in the Seven Kingdoms in his youth. I don't want them, Arya said. I want Cereal. Ned ran his fingers through his hair. Any decent master-at-arms could give Arya the rudiments of slash and parry without this nonsense of blindfolds, cartwheels, and hopping about on one leg. But he knew his youngest daughter well enough to know there was no sense in arguing with that stubborn jut of a jaw. As you wish, he said. Surely she would grow tired of this soon. Try to be careful. I will, she promised solemnly, as she hopped smoothly from her right leg to her left. Much later, after he had taken the girls back through the city and seen them both safe to bed, Sansa with her dreams and Arya with her bruises, Ned ascended to his own chambers atop the Tower of the Hand. The day had been warm, and the room was close and stuffy. Ned went to the window and unfastened the heavy shutters to let in the cool night air. Across the great yard, he noticed the flickering glow of candlelight from Littlefinger's windows. The hour was well past midnight. Down by the river, the revels were only now beginning to dwindle and die. He took out the dagger and studied it. Littlefinger's blade, won by Tyrion Lannister in a tourney wager, sent to slay Bran in his sleep. Why? Why would the dwarf want Bran dead? And why would anyone want Bran dead? The dagger, Bran's fall, all of it was linked somehow to the murder of John Aaron. He could feel it in his gut. But the truth of John's death remained as clouded to him as when he had started. Lord Stannis had not returned to King's Landing for the tourney. Lysa Aaron held her silence behind the high walls of the Eyrie. The squire was dead and Jorah was still searching the whorehouses. What did he have to do with Robert's bastard? That the armorer's sullen apprentice was the king's son, Ned had no doubt. The Baratheon look was stamped on his face, in his jaw, his eyes, that black hair. Renly was too young to have fathered a boy of that age, Stannis, too cold and proud in his armor. Gendry had to be Robert's. Yet knowing all that, what had he learned? The king had other base-born children scattered throughout the Seven Kingdoms. He had openly acknowledged one of his bastards, a broy of Bran's age, whose mother was high-born. The lad was being fostered by Lord Renly's castellan at Storm's End. Ned remembered Robert's first child as well, a daughter born in the Vale, when Robert was scarcely more than a boy himself. A sweet little girl, the young lord of Storm's End had doted on her. He used to make daily visits to play with the babe, long after he'd lost interest in the mother. Ned was often dragged along for company, whenever he willed it or not. The girl would be seventeen or eighteen now, he realized, older than Robert had been when he fathered her. A strange thought. Cersei could not have been pleased by her lord husband's by blows, yet in the end it mattered little whether or not the king had one bastard or a hundred. Law and custom gave the base-born few rights. Gentry, the girl in the veil, the boy at Storm's End, None of them could threaten Robert's true-born children. His musings were ended by a soft rap on the door. A man to see you, my lord, Herwin called. He will not give his name. Send him in, Ned said, wondering. The visitor was a stout man in a cracked mud-cake boots and a heavy brown robe of corset rough spun, his features hidden by a cowl his hands drawn up into voluminous sleeves. Who are you? Ned asked. A friend, the cowled man said in a strange, low voice. We must speak alone, Lord Stark. Curiosity was stronger than caution. Harwin, leave us, he commanded. Not until they were alone behind closed doors did his visitor draw back his cowl. 
Lord Varys, Ned said in astonishment. Lord Stark, Varys said politely, seating himself. I wonder if I might trouble you for a drink. Ned filled two cups with summer wine and handed one to Varys. It might have passed within a foot of you and never recognized you, he said, incredulous. He had never seen the eunuch dress in anything but silk and velvet and the richest damasks, and this man swel smelled of sweat instead of lilacs. That was my dearest hope, Varys said. It would not do to certain people learned that we had spoken in private. The queen watches you closely. This wine is very choice, thank you. How did you get past my other guards? Ned asked. Porter and Kane had been posted outside the tower, and Alan on the stairs. The Red Keep has ways known only to ghosts and spiders, Varys smiled apologetically. I will not keep you long, my lord. There are things you must know. You are the king's hand, and the king is a fool. The eunuch's cloying tones were gone. Now his voice was thin and sharp as a whip. Your friend, I know, yet a fool nonetheless, and doomed unless you save him. Today was a near thing. They had hoped to kill him during the melee. For a moment, Ned was speechless with shock. Who? Vera sipped his wine. If I truly need to tell you that, you are a bigger fool than Robert, and I am on the wrong side. The Lannisters, Ned said. The Queen. No, I will not believe that, not even of Cersei. She asked him not to fight. She forbade him to fight, in front of his brother, his knights, and half the court. Tell me truly, do you know any sure way to force King Robert into the melee? I ask you. Ned had a sick feeling in his gut. The eunuch had hit upon a truth. Tell Robert Baratheon he could not, should not, or must not do a thing, and it was as good as done. Even if he'd fought, who would have dared to strike the king? Varys shrugged. There were forty riders in the melee. The Lannisters have many friends. Amidst all the chaos, with horses screaming and bones breaking and Thoros of Mir waving that absurd fire sword of his, who could name it murder if some chance blow felled his grace? He went to the flagon and refilled his cup. After the deed was done, the slayer would be beside himself with grief. I can almost hear him weeping. So sad. Yet, no doubt, the gracious and compassionate widow would take pity, lift the poor unfortunate to his feet, and bless him with a gentle kiss of forgiveness. Good King Joffrey would have no choice but to pardon him. The eunuch stroked his cheek. Or perhaps Cersei would let Sir Illyn strike off his head. Less risk for the Lannisters that way, though quite an unpleasant surprise for their little friend. Ned felt his anger rise. You knew of this plot, and yet you did nothing. I command whispers, not warriors. You might have come to me earlier. Oh, yes, I confess it. And you would have rushed straight to the king, yes? And when Robert heard of this peril, what would he have done, I wonder? Ned considered that. He would have damned them all, and fought anyway to show he did not fear them. Varys spread his hands. I will make another confession, Lord Eddard. I was curious to see what you would do. Why not come to me, you ask? And I must answer. Why? Because I did not trust you, my lord. You did not trust me? Ned was frankly astonished. The Red Keep shelters two sorts of people, Lord Eddard, Varys said. Those who are loyal to the realm and those who are loyal only to themselves. Until this morning, I could not say which you might be, so I waited to see, and now I know for a certainty. He smiled a plump little smile, and for a moment his private face and public mask were one. I begin to comprehend why the Queen fears you so much. Oh, yes, I do. 
You are the one she ought to fear, Ned said. No, I am what I am. The king makes use of me, but shames him. A more puissant warrior is our Robert, and such a manly man has little love for sneaks and spies and eunuchs. If a day should come when Circe whispers, Kill that man. Ill and pain will snick off my head in a twinkling, and who will mourn poor Varus then? North or south, they sing no songs for spiders. He reached out and touched Ned with a soft hand. But you, Lord Stark, I think, no, I know. He would not kill you, not even for his queen. And there may lie our salvation. It was all too much. For a moment, Eddard Stark wanted nothing so much as to return to Winterfell the clean simplicity of the north, where the enemies were winter and the wildlings beyond the wall. Surely Robert has other loyal friends, he protested. His brothers, his wife, Varys finished with a smile that cut. His brothers hate the Lannisters, true enough, but hating the queen and loving the king are not quite the same thing, are they? Sir Barristan loves his honor, Grand Maester Pycelle loves his office, and Littlefinger loves Littlefinger. The King's Guard, a paper shield, the eunuch said. Try not to look so shocked, Lord Stark. Janie Lannister is himself a sworn brother of the White Swords, and we all know what his oath is worth. The days when men like Ryan Redwine and Prince Emon the Dragon Knight wore the white cloak gone to dust and song. Of these seven, only Sir Barristan Selmy is made of the true steel, and Selmy is old. Sir Boris and Sir Merin are the queen's creatures to the bone, and I have deep suspicions of the others. No, my lord, when the swords come out in earnest, you will truly be the only true friend to Robert Baratheon will have. Robert must be told, Ned said. If what you say is true, if even a part of it is true, the king must hear it for himself. And what proof shall we lay before him? My words against theirs. My little birds against the queen and the kingslayer, against his brothers and his council, against the wardens of the east and west, against all the might of Casterly Rock. Pray, Send for Sir Illyn directly, it will save us all some time. I know where that road ends. Yet, if what you say is true, they will only buy their time and make another attempt. Indeed they will, said Varys, and sooner rather than later I do fear. You are making them most anxious, Lord Eddard, but my little birds will be listening and together we may be able to forestall them, you and I. He rose and pulled up his cowl so his face was hidden once more. Thank you for the wine. We will speak again. When you see me next at council, be certain to treat me with your accustomed contempt. You shall not find it difficult. He was at the door when Ned called. Varys. The eunuch turned back. How did John Aaron die? I wondered when you would get to that. Tell me. The Tears of Lys, they called it. A rare and costly thing, clear and sweet as water, and it leaves no trace. I begged Lord Aaron to use a taster. In this very room I begged him, but he would not hear of it. Only one who was less than a man would even think of such a thing, he told me. Ned had to know the rest. Who gave him the poison? Some dear sweet friend who often shared meat and meat with him, no doubt. Oh, but which one? There were many such. Lord Aaron was such a kindly, trusting man. The eunuch sighed. There was one boy. All he was, he owed John Aaron. But when the widow fled to the ferry with her household, he stayed in King's Landing and prospered. It always gladdens my heart 
to see the young rise in the world. His whip was in his voice again, every word a stroke. He must have cut a gallant figure in the tourney, him in his bright new armor, with those crescent moons on his cloak. A pity he died so untimely before you could talk to him. Ned felt half-poisoned himself. The squire, he said, Sir Hugh. Wheels within wheels within wheels. Ned's head was pounding. Why? Why now? John Aaron had been had for fourteen years. What was he doing that they had to kill him? Asking questions, Varys said, slipping out the door.